I'm joined today by Dr. Umesh Kote. He is the vice chairman of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Hospital. Dr. Kote, thanks for joining me today on Doc to Doc. Good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You have a research letter coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Nitroprusside and Isoproteranol Use After Major Price Increases. Give us the outline. Why these drugs and what are the price increases you're referring to here? So these are two highly specialized drugs that we use in the hospital for cardiovascular conditions. And since about 2012, 2013, they've had dramatic price increases, about 30-fold for nitroprusside and about 70-fold for isoproteranol. So what we wanted to find out is what impact did these price increases have on the prescribing behavior of physicians for these two specialized drugs. And I want to, I, you gave us the, the, the relative increase, but I'm going to read here from your paper um, to, give, to give our viewers an example. Nitroprusside 50 milligrams in 2012 cost $27. In 2015, the price was $881. For isoproteranol, one milligram in 2012 was $26, and the price went up in 2015 to $1,790. So before we get into your results, what, are, what was the reason for this price increase? There's a lot of different reasons, but these drugs, which are traditionally generic, now basically had one manufacturer who then had made a strategic decision to increase their prices as part of their business strategy. So this is something that they did, and they didn't face any competition, so there wasn't any uh, competitor that could come in and undercut them with regards to pricing. So there was no raw material shortage, in, in other words, this was this was this price increased because it was the price the market would bear potentially that was the thought from the strategy from the company in terms of they thought that the drug was originally underpriced and so they wanted to get it to a, to a higher price uh, from their perspective now now congress watchers will remember potentially these two drugs uh came under the spotlight in 2015 um the the uh, rights to these drugs were purchased by Valiant Pharmaceuticals, and uh, the CEO at the time, uh, Howard Schiller, actually testified before Congress about the steep price increases. Were the prices increasing prior to acquisition by Valiant, or was this a uh, purchase with an intent to increase the price, do you think? It was a combination. I mean, the prices had actually already started to increase before Valiant had got involved, but then the price increases continued uh, under Valiant's jurisdiction. So it was a combination of price increases that had started before and then continued. And let's get to your results. You looked at uh, uh, roughly 50 hospitals in an integrated health system to see how their use of these two agents changed from 2012 to 2015. And what did you find? We saw actually a quite dramatic reduction in the utilization of the drugs, and both nitroprusside and isoproteranol uses dropped by almost 50%. So in contrast to what had been thought that these price increases would not have had an impact on utilization, we actually saw a quite dramatic decrease in utilization of these two drugs. It, what was the thinking behind why they wouldn't see a decrease? I'm, I'm remembering my college economics course here, right? It's, as the price goes up, wouldn't we expect uh, you usage to go down was that that wasn't expected there are sort of a couple reasons why i think they didn't think that the would impact utilization one is that it's thought that pharmaceuticals are what is called price insensitive so they thought that the pricing really wouldn't make a difference because these pharmaceuticals are so necessary the second reason is that these pharmaceuticals are usually bundled within a larger hospital payment so the costs are sort of hidden from both consumers and payers, and so they thought that these costs would just have possibly been absorbed within the hospital payment and there wouldn't have been any impact. In other words, the, not the traditional free market that, that, that we think of in the college economics course, or this is a bit more obscure, not as much information available to the potential payers? Right, exactly. And, but I think in the end, our, our uh, study did show that the college economic texts are correct, and there is a drop in uh, utilization with price increases. Did you find that other drugs were replacing these drugs? Uh, I, I, are they necessary, in other words? These drugs uh, you don't have any other, you know, they can't be generically substituted or there aren't any clear alternatives. So one of the things we don't know is that what are people doing in response to this in terms of the exact mechanism, in terms of are they substituting with other drugs, or are they just stopping using them? 
that's something that's an important area for future research in this area. You report an uptick in uh, nitroglycerin usage in, in, in your paper. Uh, presumably, that is a viable replacement for nitroprusside. You're a cardiologist in your, in your personal practice. Do you think those are interchangeable drugs? They can be used in certain conditions, but I'm not sure if, you know, if this was one-to-one. -one. The database that we have doesn't really allow us to show that people were replacing one drug with the other. But you're correct in the sense that this would be a viable replacement in certain conditions, particularly, for example, you know, uncontrolled hypertension or sometimes in heart failure. So I think that people are probably doing this, and th these nitroglycerin drugs didn't have the price increases that were seen with nitroprusside. Now, the prices you report in the paper are the wholesale acquisition prices of the drug, the, the, the so-called list prices of the drug. Do we have any data about what hospitals are actually paying? That's very difficult to get because each of those contracts are often negotiated individually by the hospital and they're often negotiated even through other group purchasing agents. So it's sometimes difficult to find out what actual hospitals are paying. But in general, because of the fact that there aren't alternatives to this, it's likely that the hospitals did probably bear the majority of these price increases, uh, if, even if they didn't bear all of it. Mm. There's been a lot of criticism about uh, price increases of pharmaceutical agents uh, across a variety of agents in a variety of conditions. Does your study suggest that actually the market works? You know, a, a, a drug company can increase its prices and demand will subsequently fall and, and so there is some equilibrium that will be reached. Are the concerns overblown? Well, I don't know if the concerns are overblown, but you're correct in the sense that there is a market response. And so what I think our findings showed is that there's a cost to uh, a pharmaceutical company when they take on these price increases, that they're going to see a loss of market share. And so I think this is a novel finding from our standpoint as we quantified what that loss of market share was, uh, and it was quite substantial. Certainly, although, uh, and uh, this, is my, uh, this is my basic math uh, being revealed again, but you, know, you have price increases ranging from a factor of 30 to a factor of 70, and a market share decrease of about 50%. Uh, from a bottom line standpoint, if I'm a pharmaceutical executive, I'm pretty happy with this regardless, right? I'm, I'm, I'm still making, you know, an order of magnitude more than I was making before off this drug. So that is correct. The only thing that's concerning from that standpoint is if you look at the change in utilization over time, it appears to be accelerating. So I think that if we look at this data going forward, we may see even further reductions with time so that I don't think that the drop in market share at this time is the end point. It may actually be going further down because when we looked at our data for 2014 through 2015, the gap in utilization was increasing over time. So I think that uh, all we can describe is these are the share market share responses over about a two year time period. There may be further changes over time uh, as these prices continue to, to get into the market. It'll be interesting to see how prices respond to that and how demand responds over time, certainly. On that note, um, fixing this issue, uh, it seems like greater availability of generics would be an easy solution to some of these dramatic price increases. Is that something you endorse or are you looking at other ideas to improve the price of pharmaceutical drugs? You know, it's always uh, cautious to get into policy discussions, uh, but I think, you know, what our, what our analysis shows is that you know peop, uh, pharmaceutical companies in this case can increase prices there is a market uh, cost for them to bear uh, at least in the short term and I think to the standpoint of you know competition I think is good and having you know alternatives is a good option from the standpoint of uh, people and physicians having choices so I think that I think that uh, competition is something that would benefit you know patients uh, physicians policymakers um, and a lot of different people in terms of having a, a market of options to choose. In terms of those options, you mentioned these drugs have been around for a long time. These are no longer patent protected, you know, novel agents that enjoy some period of monopoly status. Any idea why we don't have a bunch of generics uh, floating around for isoproterenol and nitroprusside? These drugs are what are called intravenous injectable drugs, so their manufacturing can be somewhat difficult and 
there has been a drop off in the number of manufacturers overall for these drugs in general, not just these two drugs. And so that's caused some issues with regard to shortage and otherwise. What I think is happening now, and we're seeing this, for example, in nitroprusside, is that because the price is now so high, there have been some other generic manufacturers that are working to get into the market. And that has started from that standpoint. And there are other people who are getting approved so they can actually sell in this market because they want to you know, take some of the share uh, uh, you know, because the price is so high. So I think actually that's the other side of this thing is that when the prices are so high, then it actually will draw in other competitors because they see this as a market they want to compete in. Well, Dr. Cote, this is absolutely fascinating research. Thank you for joining me today. We look forward to seeing how this plays out in the future as healthcare costs continue to increase. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for the opportunity today. Thank you.